Thank you very much. Before we came into the room, um, into this hall, we saw an exhibition of the, the victims of the 1988 massacre, and we actually saw some of the relatives of some of those victims. And as we were looking at it, I spoke to my very good friend, Professor Shea Bass here, that um, all the images and the story we hear, or we see, uh, reminds me of a book I read as a young schoolboy in Nigeria. Uh, it's a George Orwell book, book called Animal Farm. Some of you may have read that book or known about it. But let me try and recall the story of that book. It is the tale of a revolution. Um, Farmer Jones um, has a farm, and the animals in his farm thought he was, or he is, oppressive, and there needs to be a revolution to kick him and his farm hands out. An old major one of the animals in the farm um, tells the story of a world without humans who are tyrants, humans who walked on two legs, humans who will kill animals and feed on animals, humans who would sleep on beds. So the Revolution now had a motto. That motto is four legs good, two legs bad. And they followed that with um, a hymn or a song, the anthem called Beasts of England. Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, beasts of every land and clime. Hearken to my joyful tiding of a golden future time. Uh, soon or late, the day is coming, tyrant man shall be overthrown, and the fruitful fields of England shall be trod by beasts alone. Now, eventually, the revolution is executed successfully. Farmer Jones is driven out of his farm. The farm renamed from Manor Farm to Animal Farm. That is the title of the book. And they, in the aftermath of the revolution, they had um, Several, seven simple um, commandments plastered at the gate of the um, farm and all over strategic places in the farm. Uh, commandments like um, anything that walks on two legs is an enemy, and anything that walks on four legs or has wings is a friend. No animal shall sleep on bed. No animal shall kill another animal because that is what tyrant humans do, and so on and so forth. Now, what emerged in the aftermath of that um, revolution was an aristocratic class amongst them now decided to appropriate the revolution and to rule it. Mind you, this tale from George Orwell was written in 1945 as a satire on the Soviet Union or on communism 
and that was long before the Iranian revolution, of course. But now the aristocratic class amongst the animals, as I said, started breaking all those rules that they had laid down. They started dressing like humans, wearing clothes. They started even learning how to walk on their hind legs, that is, standing on two feet. Remember, um, four legs go two legs back. Now, they are walking on two legs. And what is more, um, the leadership of the animal farm now had contrived upon themselves to kill fellow animals whom they branded as walking with the enemy to overtake the farm once again. Now, as I said, this story was written with Soviet Union in mind. You might want to tell me what else that story recalls to you. And that was what we saw in the room. And that is the story of the 1988 massacre. But we can't leave it at that. Uh, this story of the 1988 massacre has uh, captured the anxiety of many important voices uh, in the human rights field, Human Rights Watch, uh, an eminent human rights organization, Amnesty International, um, Treaty, oh, sorry, Mandate Holders of the United Nations have also worried and expressed concern that the lack of acknowledgement of the 1988 massacre, the massacre itself amounts to the crime of at least enforced disappearance. And the crime of enforced disappearance is a continuing crime until there is an acknowledgement of what happened to the victims. So, and that is the justice that you call for, Madam President, you and your organization, and I join in that call. Uh, in the exhibition hall, there is a board uh, with 152, I believe, uh, eminent personalities around the world who have called for a formal uh, UN or international inquiry into the 19. 88 massacre. Now, I am not eminent, but I hope you can add me to one of the voices who call for the United Nations to... Thank you. To conduct that formal inquiry. Um, that call is not based on mere hope or mere, should we say, uh, it has to be based on hope. Let me revise that. That call is not based on merely what we think is the right thing. Of course it is the right thing. But that call is actually based on a promise that the United Nations has made to the world in 2005 the promise of responsibility to protect. Uh, that responsibility to, pr to protect says that every country has the primary obligation to respect and the rights and dignity of the people within their borders and also to protect them from serious violations of international law. But when they fail to do that, then the international community has a say in the matter. And a critical element of that responsibility to protect doctrine or promise is the element of accountability. It is for that reason that I strongly join the call for a proper, a formal investigation of that massacre. I thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today.
would now like to invite Dr. Chile Obo Osuji, who addressed our gathering previously, to make a few additional remarks. Please welcome him to the podium. Thank you very much. It is late and um, it's been a very fruitful day, so I will not keep us long. Uh, only to say that on behalf of those of us who have been here, it has been a humbling experience to come and listen to the witnesses themselves, the survivors of these crimes and their relatives. We heard from Mrs. Rajavi herself, who not only is the president of NCRI, but is a family member of uh, victims of these crimes. We heard from Mr. Mahmoud Royae. Um, we've heard from uh, Mr. Reza Shamirani and a group of survivors. And we heard from Ms. Sima um, Zaye and a group of families. Again, it is truly humbling to hear these stories as opposed to just reading about them from afar. We've also heard from a legal expert, some of my colleagues in the field, who spoke about the, that eventually justice will be done in relation to the 1988 massacre. We had, for instance, from Professor Sadat, Ms. Palin, who made that point, and we had from Judge Schomburg, who says that when this justice gets done, there will be immunity for no one. Now, that is for the 1988 massacre, and I did say that it is an ongoing crime, the crime of enforced disappearance. But there is something else that is important to stress. Uh, perhaps this would be a free legal advice to the government itself, the government of Iran. There are stories about pursuing members of the Iranian resistance who are overseas, who are in the diaspora, who are in Albania, for instance. I understand that in 2018, that there was a plot to bomb a gathering of um, a conference hosted in somewhere near Paris, but that was foiled. And the message there is we need to consider carefully the implications of that kind of contact. People think states get into complacency in thinking, well, we are not members of the Rome Statute, members of the ICC, so ICC cannot touch us. I think the government in Russia will not say that today. The government in Myanmar will not say that. Why am I mentioning these two governments? In Myanmar, the ICC has claimed jurisdiction over what happened in Myanmar because the Rohingyas we are persecuted in Myanmar and they cross border into Bangladesh, Bangladesh being a state party to the Rome Statute. And that gave the ICC jurisdiction. In relation to Ukraine, Ukraine declared that it has accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. Because of that, what happened in Ukraine moved straight into the jurisdiction of the ICC as we speak, not about tomorrow when Russia would, or would not become a state party to the Rome Statute, or tomorrow when Myanmar may or may not become a state party to the Rome Statute. We are talking about jurisdiction today of the ICC over governments that are not state parties to the Rome Statute. It's important to stress that because some of the countries where members of the resistance now live 
um, Albania, France, UK, and other countries are member states of the Rome Statute. And to commit crimes against humanity, against those members of the resistance movement in the territory of states parties to the Rome Statute gives the ICC immediate jurisdiction over those who are responsible for that crime and not to wait for tomorrow when Iran may become or may not become member state of the Rome Statute. We speak about in the moment. It is important to stress that. And in that context, again, one revisits the opinion of George Schoenberg that when that jurisdiction is claimed, Article 27 of the Rome Statute says no one, not even heads of state, would enjoy immunity from the jurisdiction of the ICC. I do think it's important to stress that. And on that note, I thank you very much for inviting me. And you have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you.